Okay, assalamu alaikum, good evening and welcome uh, to what is the second lecture in the BSMA's Invited Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Sakiri Ashkir, I'm the President of the BSMA and the co-host of this evening's lecture. With me I have Dr. Shadia Ahmed, who is a microbiologist and a fellow BSMA member interested in global health. Uh, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to have with us Professor John Rees, who's a Professor Emeritus of Medical Education at King's College London and someone with a vast experience in medical education and global health. Uh, he's advised on medical education in many different places around the world. Uh, but this evening's lecture really is about his involvement with the King Somaliland Partnership, a project which has modernized medical education in Somaliland, and one which really sets an example for many uh, Somali medical schools in the region. There's lots to really learn from this great uh, project. Um, and without further ado, uh, welcome, Professor. Please go ahead. Zach, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to give this talk. It's great to meet people interested in uh, Somali medicine and, and medical education. Now I'm gonna try and share my screen and see if that uh, works. So uh, I think it should be this. Uh, so does that work? Can you see that? Great, okay. Uh, hmm. Great. So I'm going to talk about uh, supporting medical education in Somalia through collaboration and particularly about the, the King Somaliland Partnership, uh, which I've been involved with for about 11 years or so, but which uh, goes back further than that. So it starts uh, the story back nearly, nearly 30 years ago now, and it starts with um, Andy Leather, who's a surgeon at King's and now uh, runs the uh, Global Health Partnerships at King's. And in 1992, he was approached about a Somali refugee family in South London, where he was living. And he became involved with them and became interested in the situation in uh, Somalia and Somaliland. And subsequently was invited to visit. And in 2000, so 21 years ago now, he uh, visited Edna Adan Hospital in Hargeza uh, in Somaliland. And that's when the link started. And since then, our main links have been to Armoud University, uh, to University of Hargeza, uh, the group hospital in Hargeza, and to try to have contact, particularly with the ministries of health and education. And a lot of this has been in partnership with a, an NGO called THET, the Tropical Health and Education Trust who have a presence in uh, Hargeza and have been involved particularly in the logistics of uh, what we do. So the, the two universities particularly we've been involved with are Mood University, uh, the Boroughmore College of Health Sciences. Uh, in the top right of the pictures, the health faculty at um, uh, our Mood. Uh, and with the Dean, Dr. Walhad, who qualified in Mogadishu. Uh, and they started a medical school in 2000, 2001. Uh, and they started small, they started with just six uh, medical students who graduated in 2007. So that around that time, they start, when they started, they had 15 students in the health faculties and three lecturers. Uh, and now that's gone up to be 750 students and 73 lecturers. And now they've expanded from uh, where they started with medicine and nursing to midwifery, dentistry, pharmacy, laboratory sciences, and uh, public health programs. And they have a postgraduate program, a three-year program in family medicine. So that's our mood, the first medical school to, to have graduates in Somaliland. And the other uh, main link has been with the University of Hargeza. The picture is of the campus of uh, Hargeza uh, University. This uh, was founded in 2000 and their first medical graduates came in 2009. So a little bit after our mood. And they have health uh, training in medicine in nursery and midwifery. And their Dean, Dr. Daria Ereg, very sadly, this is Dr. Daria in the middle of this photo with graduates a couple of years ago. 
uh, Dr. Daria died from part of the COVID outbreak just last month in Hargeza Group Hospital. Uh, so very sad. He, he was probably the first uh, person I met and interacted with when I went to Somaliland. So it's very distressing to hear about Dr. Daria's death uh, linked to COVID. So that's uh, uh, University of Hargeza. So two medical schools started up 2000, 2002. Very few faculty, uh, little training or experience in uh, running a medical school or, or in higher education. Very limited resources in terms of laboratories or libraries and very poor clinical facilities. And it was a very a brave thing to start up these medical schools, I think at the time, uh, seeing the need that there was in the country. But uh, this is a sign which stands outside the University of Hargeza and it sort of sums up the Somali approach uh, that we've found that uh, they are uh, resourceful and innovative and have a you know, desire to, to make things happen. Uh, and that's what made these medical schools, I think, uh, successful. It, at the time that we first went out, there were 80 doctors in uh, Somaliland for a population of probably about three and a half million. Uh, that gives a ratio of one to 45,000 of the population compared to a you know, UK ratio of one in 350. So over a hundred times less doctors for the population. This is the, the group hospital uh, on the left here, made up of uh, ward blocks like this, uh, dating back to the time of the British protectorate when it was built. Uh, and the hospital uh, is the biggest sort of tertiary hospital there, uh, public hospital. And King's involvement over the 2000 to 2017 was uh, in a number of areas. It was support for the training of doctors and nurses. So we've done very little <clears throat> in the way of direct clinical work. We've uh, not had people full-time living in Somaliland. So it's all been visits and online support. Uh, so we've supported training of, of interns, of uh, residents, of uh, undergraduates, and of faculty in the university uh, by doing uh, teaching trips. So particularly, I'll say a little bit more about mental health, uh, which was a, a big uh, gap in their teaching. Uh, and also from the start with help, help with their final examinations from 2007. And we've also tried to keep um, close contact consultations with ministries of health and education in order to try to influence strategy and uh, uh, practice and organization within the health system. Mental health uh, was a big part of the teaching early on because there, when we first went out, there was no psychiatrist in, in Somaliland for the whole population. Uh, and uh, a uh, number of our initial teaching trips were in uh, mental health to teach uh, medical students and nurses. So the only teaching going on in mental health was from King's volunteers going out. They taught particularly the WHO MH gap uh, approach to, to mental health and things improved. So here's a picture of the out on the top left of the outside of the mental health uh, unit at Hargeza Group Hospital, which was pretty primitive, involved chaining up patients. Uh, but um, uh, Jibril here, the top right, was one of the first graduates out there. Uh, and it went into a training in psychiatry, set up a, um, a community psychiatry approach in Boroma. And uh, you can see the from a regional hospital mental health ward, which was developed there. So, so evidence of things uh, have improved in some of these areas. And this was a important area of our teaching early on. So our, uh, we became involved with medical school assessment, 
which may seem a slightly odd place to start, but we um, supplied external examiners to uh, both Armoud and Boroma, uh, Armoud and Hargeza uh, from 2007. And uh, when we started this, they were using what's often regarded as old style medical examinations. They started using long case, short case type examinations. And there was a feeling amongst the faculty that these were unreliable, a feeling amongst the students that they were biased. Um, and we were asked to introduce OSCEs, Objective Structured Clinical Examinations, which a lot of you are probably familiar with to the medical schools in 2011. And that was the first time that I went out. Uh, and since then, we've helped with the delivery, uh, writing, and the quality control of their written examinations and their clinical OSCE examinations. And the aim of this was to say, well, if you made the the bar, the right height, if you may, if you had proper, uh, reliable, valid, um, quality controlled final examinations as the hurdle to getting people out of medical school, then we hoped that that would drive learning and drive curricular development and help to protect the, the public by having a fair examination. So that was our reason for for concentrating, I think, quite a lot on, on the assessment from quite early in the process. So we began to run OSCEs. Uh, here's our OSCE at uh, Hargeza Group Hospital. So we took over this block, a couple of these blocks, which were single private wards, and the hospital agreed to empty these rooms see the OSCE instructions here out, outside the room. So students would go from one of these rooms to another. This is our pediatric external examiner, enjoying a, a little break there in the sunshine. Uh, and this system worked pretty well. There are, also, there are sort of goats and things wandering around the hospital. Occasionally a goat would wander into an OSCE station, but uh, never passed an OSCE station as far as I know. Uh, and, and in Borrow in our mood, uh, we had different facilities. We were, um, security was a big issue early on. So this was our security for the OSCEs. Um, and uh, in our mood, they set up a, uh, an OSCE so resource center. Um, and it came to look like this after some funding put in partitions. So here are the students reading the instructions outside the OSCE stations. And THET, the Tropical Health Education Trust, provided funding for video cameras in each of these OSCE stations. Uh, and these were relayed into a central uh, room at the end of the corridor. So for the OSCEs in, in our mood, we were able to keep an eye on every OSCE station for, with a, a video. Uh, really quite uh, sophisticated resources for, for an OSCE exam which uh, um, took place uh, there in, in our mood. Uh, and this really helped in, I think, developing their uh, OSCEs. So in 2011, when uh, uh, we started, we started with OSCEs in just our mood. There were just 10 students. And uh, 2012, we had uh, OSCEs also in Hargeza. And then the numbers sort of steadily increased through to 2017. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happened after that in a moment. But uh, steadily increasing numbers of students. Um, so making the organization a bit more tricky. Uh, you can see the pass rates. If you look at this final column, which is people passing for the at their first attempt. Uh, it has been pretty steadily since the first year, about 75, 80%. So lower than you'd get in UK medical schools, but pretty respectable. Uh, it's quite tricky because they have to pass all five subjects. They take uh, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OBS and gynae, and mental health, uh, and they have to pass all five of those to graduate. Um, We've tried to advise that this should all combine into one overall graduation test, but they are still a bit resistant to that. So numbers going up and the OSCEs going uh, 
uh, reasonably well. And then in 2017, uh, there was a sort of step change in our involvement. So we received what's called a SPHERE grant, Strategic Partnerships for Higher Education, Innovation and Reform. So this is a grant from UK government from DFID, the Department for International Development. And it was the, we received the first SPHERE grant. This was the first uh, time that DFID had embarked on higher education funding. And we were the first uh, the grants that were given for you know, more than three million pounds to run over five years. And uh, the program that we set up was called Prepared for Practice. It was trying to make sure that uh, people coming out of health training were prepared to go into clinical practice. And there were three uh, arms to uh, the involvement. One around undergraduate learning and assessment, one around faculty and institutional development, and one around policy and regulation. So it's a five-year program coming to the end later this year, and with the aim that we made changes which were sustainable within the universities uh, and which were able to be cascaded out to other uh, faculties and, and other universities. So these three arms to this, trying to get to prepared for practice uh, uh, and um, through, as I say, undergraduate learning assessment, faculty development and policy and regulation. Uh, with the aim that if you had people prepared for practice, then health outcomes would uh, improve, although that's a little bit difficult, to, more difficult to establish. So looking at these three arms of what we've been doing over the last four to five years, uh, on the undergraduate teaching side, we've run online courses, uh, which are now part of the programs for uh, medical students at uh, Armoud and uh, Hargeza and nursing students at Edna Adan University. Uh, so we've run almost 150 courses for uh, people in different years of the program for so for over 800 students. Uh, so courses that are run recently, clinical reasoning is a popular area for running courses for them in, in different subjects, run courses in communication skills, radiology at a time when there was <clears throat> really no radiology teaching going on, neurology, continuing mental health, basic research skills. And you know, for online courses, these have been pretty successful with 80% of the students uh, signing up to the courses, finishing and completing them. And these, like most of our work, is all delivered by NHS volunteers who, who do these courses in, in their uh, spare time. Uh, so we've been carried on running those courses. Those have been able to carry on in the same way during COVID because they're all run online. Uh, and the second arm of what we've been doing has been around faculty and institutional development. So for from 2011 to 2017, I was going out and I was running you know, a week's course on writing questions or write a week's course on curriculum design or a week's course on how to lecture or something. Uh, and it sort of it was seemed to work well when you were out there, but the question was, did it have any long term benefit because you would go out there for a week and teach people and then disappear and come back in six months and, and not much had changed. Uh, so the the plan as part of this grant was to get some continuity into the faculty development. So we developed a master's in health professions education. Uh, and uh, people who entered this could, if they got through the first year, they received a certificate in HPE, completing four modules, essentials in teaching and learning, clinical teaching and supervision, assessment, and uh, planning and evaluation of courses and sessions. Uh, so each of, the, each of the first three of these was done by two tutors going out and teaching face-to-face -face for a week and then following that up with online teaching and uh, assignments. And then if people went through that, they could go on and do a second year of a diploma in HP, uh, one module on research in health education, one on leadership and administration, 
and then a practical uh, teaching project which they would plan and deliver. And if they got through that, the plan was that they would go on and do a master's in health uh, professionals education, which was a, basically a, an 8,000, 10,000 word dissertation. So this was to try to get some continuity and develop a, a community of people interested in medical education within the universities. Uh, so we, we did this, we had 24 students uh, started in the first year, 18 of those went on to do the diploma. And then the, the second year of recruiting and the certificate, we had 34, the third year we had 31. Uh, so good numbers going through this. Uh, they were not all uh, uh, medical uh, faculty. We wanted to try to introduce an interprofessional approach. So we, this is me teaching, but hidden behind this pillar, there's a, a, also a nurse who's with me. So we had interprofessional teaching and interprofessional involvement of uh, faculty, faculty from all of the health uh, faculty or health sciences. Uh, and this we think we feel has been really a, a success story. Um, and in order to make it sustainable, uh, so this is our first group of uh, certificate um, participants in Hargeza with uh, Joe, the nurse who's co led this with me and me. Uh, and these are our group in Hargeza. And after they been through the diploma, so these are all people who've done the diploma, after they've done the diploma, then we recruited them into co-teaching with us on the next year of the certificate. So Fikru here, Osman, Hassan, uh, have all been involved in uh, co-teaching for us uh, on the certificate as they go through the program. And this uh, has been a way of trying to introduce them to keeping the whole thing going when we uh, stop being able to go. And the sustainability looks good. So in 2020-21, this over this past year, uh, both Armood and Hargeza have set up educational development centers, have appointed people to run educational development centers, which were not there before. And both of them have gone on to start delivering the certificate year of the HPE course. So after just three to four years of uh, doing this for themselves, they're now teaching that to the next lot of faculty. Uh, and uh, our mood have decided that everybody in their faculty must go through the certificate of, of HPE to get trained in teaching and assessment. So we're, we're very pleased with the way that's gone. The third stream uh, was the uh, policy and regulation stream. Uh, we've been involved in uh, supporting the assessment of medical schools. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the way that medical schools have uh, uh, has been set up across uh, Somaliland. So assessment was set up against the equivalent of World Federation of Medical Education standards. So all medical schools were inspected and evaluated against these standards. We were also involved in helping the government set up a medical education policy for the way medical education should go forward in Somaliland. Although I have to say the implementation of that has probably has not been completely as we might have liked. We um, have helped with the a finalization of a national harmonized uh, curriculum for medical education and uh, helping a move towards getting harmonized assessment across the different medical schools. So th this has been the, uh, the policy and regulation and this has been really uh, important and necessary because there was very little quality control of what was going on in medical schools and medical schools were beginning to sort of start up around the place. So uh, as I said, in early in the 2000s, Armud and Hargeza set up medical schools and they were um, state medical schools. So they were public medical schools. But since then, uh, you know, medical schools have sprung up all over the place. So Gollis University in uh, 
uh, Hargeza set up a medical school, Burao uh, set up a medical school, that's a public, another public medical school in 2011, Burao's a, quite a long way from Hargeza and Armoud. France Fanon University in Hargeza set a school, Tumuade in Gabile, a, a little town 20, 30 kilometers from Hargeza set up a medical school, Hope University in Hargeza did Edna Adan set up their own medical school. Adal in Boromir set up a medical school. And there's talk of further medical schools in Berbera, Erigavo, more in, uh, 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 more in uh, Hargeza. Uh, uh, and there was no real regulation of this at all. You know, if you had a big enough room, you'd set up a medical school and set up a university and nobody said anything about it. So there was no control. Um, so uh, I'll come back to how those have performed in a minute, but if we look at, uh, to try to look through the assessment lens, to try to say, have we done anything about the quality within the medical schools in Armud and Hargeza? So these are the uh, average scores for uh, Hargeza in blue and Armud in green in their written exams. And the written exams are all standardized. So they're standard set and adjusted to have a, a consistent mark in the quality. So uh, the pass mark is this red line here. And you can see that over the last four or five years, the, the marks in these written exams within these two universities have been steadily rising. There was a little blip in our mood here when they'd been forced to take uh, a whole lot extra students by the government and really had more students than they could cope with. Uh, and they had a sort of bad year. And then in, <clears throat> in the OSCE, similarly, the OSCEs are all standard set and uh, adjusted to a uh, common baseline, which is in the red here. And again, you see the students in Armud and Hargeza uh, marks have been steadily increasing over these last few years. Uh, so this is, um, uh, I think some evidence that we might be having a beneficial effect on the quality of the students coming out as judged by uh, these uh, examinations. Uh, now, when, when the new medical schools started, uh, they, and in 2018, a few of them had their first graduates. Uh, and uh, the five uh, medical schools involved then, so one, two, three, four, five, six medical schools involved then, uh, took the same written exam. Uh, and these are how the marks came out. So uh, these are now standardized so that to fit with their university pass mark of 60% being a pass. Uh, and uh, the five subjects and the overall mark. And you see that our mood students were getting an average mark you know, well above the pass mark for the exam. Uh, Hargeza were doing the same. And these are the other four universities who took exactly the same examinations. And marks were, average marks were well below the pass mark for, e for every one of these exams. Tumuade, oops, sorry, I'm trying to go back. Tumu Tumuade in Gabile, which had about five students being trained in a pretty small hospital, had marks which, I mean, the lowest marks I've ever seen in this sort of examination. Most of these are one best of four, one best of five marks. So if you randomly ticked, you would get a mark between 20 and 25%. Uh, so these had, I think, something to say about the quality of what was going on in the training. Uh, and, and the pass marks for that year were you know, 80 to 90 percent in Armud and Hargeza. In Golis, which had been having graduates for a year or two, they're 26 percent. In Burao, none of the 13 students of their first year passed all five of the subjects. Uh, and in 2020, we um, gave some help to Barau Gollis and, and Franz Fanon to, uh, in, in producing their own examinations. They didn't do the same examinations, uh, but the pass marks here were again 
uh, you know, a pass rate, sorry, only half the students or less than half in these universities were passing their final exams compared to uh, Armut and Hargeza where the examinations were actually more rigorous, but the passing was much higher. So there is a real need to start you know, trying to control, uh, quality control some of these uh, universities. So do, do the people who come out feel they are prepared for practice? Well, uh, this was asked to them. And these are the answers of the interns and the final year students in, in our Mood University. And, and most people did feel that they were pretty well prepared. Actually, if you ask this question to UK graduates, you get numbers which are a bit less than this. Uh, in Hargeza, they weren't so confident that they were well prepared. Uh, and I think this is uh, partly because the, uh, the clinical supervision is a bit more difficult in Hargeza and Hargeza Group Hospital. Our moods are smaller environment, more better controlled environment in clinical supervision. Uh, are, are they working in the, in the health system? Uh, they graduates well in our mood yes mainly they were in Hargeza quite a lot of the female graduates were not actually uh, working after they came out of internship uh, and part of this is I think because uh, the the graduates in Hargeza tend to stay in Hargeza whereas a lot of the need for them to work is out in some of the regions away from the main cities and they're a bit reluctant to move out there now in 2020, uh, we were unable to send anybody out to the uh, exa final examinations. Usually we'd send between two and five external examiners. We couldn't do that. So they all ran their examinations on their own. We helped with preparing the papers. We were able to watch some of what was going on with video observation. Uh, and we help particularly here in Hargeza and in Armud and in Burao, which, which ran uh, video observed um, examinations this, this last year. And we collaborated then the standard setting. There are some areas where they really still find some difficulty, particularly in standard setting and processing results. So we, we help with that. But the interesting thing was that we couldn't go, so people had to do their own thing and they did really really well actually and I think it showed us that we perhaps could have been uh, more um, pushy in pushing them to uh, in, in sort of stepping back a little bit from our involvement uh, a little bit earlier and COVID forced that to happen uh, and you know perhaps it was a bit of a, a bit of a good thing coming out of COVID that they took on responsibility and proved to themselves and to us that they could do that. So drawing uh, to a, a close, what, what are my conclusions from our involvement and what's been going on? Well, uh, I think the the continuity of the partnership has been crucial. Now, we've been working with the same people there for 20 years now in some of these universities. And that's uh, led to a, you know, a confidence that we're, we're still there and we're uh, going to continue to be there. And I think that's been critical to uh, getting our involvement, particularly with getting some involvement with ministries uh, within the country. Uh, because of the way medical schools have sprung up and some of these are private medical schools and are in it for profit not for any other real reason regulation and quality control is really essential for the future uh, for people to feel that graduates of um, Somali medical schools are properly trained we think or, or I think that the faculty development program has been a sort of game changer in in, in learning it's changed the style of learning when, when we went there uh, the teaching was completely didactic teaching. People would just stand in front of the class, show you know, 100 slides crammed with text, 
uh, and think that because they'd shown this information to students, students must have learned it uh, without any opportunity for them to ask questions, to get involved in any sort of active learning. Uh, and I think if you talk to faculty now, they, they realize that there are better ways of doing teaching. Uh, I think we've been really impressed by the, the really positive can-do attitude and the ingenuity of our Somali partners. Uh, uh, and that's been uh, shown UK partners what you can do in uh, without ideal resources. And I think it's been really helpful learning for the, uh, the volunteers who've been involved in, in the program from the UK end. I think there are real promising signs of sustainability of, of developments. We were worried with a five-year program, the SPHERE grant, that we could really deliver that sustainability in that time scale. But I think the Somali partners have really taken that on. Uh, and we will continue our involvement, continue to help them deliver that. But we hope that they can carry on and deliver the HP, the Health Professionals Education course uh, in the future. I guess there are real alarm bells about what's happening with UK uh, aid funding. So the government's uh, decision to reduce from 0.7 to 0.5%, uh, I think that may have even greater reductions in, in funding for Somali grants. Uh, so I think reductions in that funding uh, do have issues from us. We're having to look uh, for funding elsewhere uh, and uh, I think if anything can be done to change UK government mind on uh, the uh, value of uh, this sort of funding, then I think we, you know, any pressure would be really welcome on that. So uh, that's, I guess, what I want to say that we really have um, uh, learned a lot on our end from these partnerships with uh, uh, our Somali colleagues and have been really impressed by the way they've uh, been prepared to take things on. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that, Zach and Shadia. I'll um, stop sharing and then we can see if there are any questions anybody people want to, want to ask or any comments people want to make and I'll be happy to try to answer them. You're on mute, Zach. I think I'm the one who needs IT support. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Very, uh, really wide, wide, encompassing a wide range of uh, aspects of medical education in Somaliland. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat, but uh, it'd be good maybe to start off with Shadi if she had any questions, um, and then we'll, we'll go to the uh, chat. The questions in the chat. Are you on mute as well? Let me let me just unmute you. Thank you, um, Zach, for unmuting me. And also thank you um, to um, Professor Reeves for such an excellent talk. It's really interesting. And as a volunteer for the um, KSP tutorials, it's really fascinating to hear what the outcomes are for the students at the end of the day, because that's not something that I get to see. Um, so I guess my first question would be, um, what role can um, organisations like the BS BSMA and, and others play to help um, the KSP moving forward, really, in delivering education and, and support to Somaliland healthcare? Great, Shari. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thanks for your support in, in the tutorials. Uh, I think there's plenty of scope for people being involved in, in tutorials. Uh, there are also lots of um, you know, other uh, areas which we're trying to develop in Somaliland uh, around the group hospital, around uh, uh, trauma care and around uh, management and hospital management. Uh, and uh, I think there are going to be opportunities for people to be involved in, in those in the future. Uh, so keeping in touch with uh, the KSP website, and that would be great. Um, and I think you know, you're ideal people to be involved because you uh, understand the, the culture and the context, which is really important. 
uh, sometimes it's a bit of a culture shock for UK volunteers getting involved and going out, but uh, you're much more likely to uh, have uh, understanding of that. So it would be great to have people from uh, uh, from your organization involved both in, in volunteering, in helping helping us to to see what, what are the right ways to be going as well. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, what platform are these uh, tutorials on? Are they oh, they right. Yeah, I should have said something about it. Well, it was one of our partners is a, an organization, organization called Medicine Africa. Uh, and they set up a platform which uh, was initially just a text-based platform. So when, when all this started, um, IT was a, a bit of an issue and uh, bandwidth was an issue uh, and connect connectability was a problem. So our uh, uh, tutorials, um, particularly early on, were all done with, with text. So you would type in a question and people were answering text and it, uh, that was it's also quite a useful way for because uh, English is a second language for most of the students although they are uh, taught it in English largely um, it, it can be hard for them uh, and uh, using the text was quite useful for that and had a, a provided a record uh, since then, the Medicine Africa has enlarged a bit, so you can now use audio and video on uh, on the platform. But it's all been done through a, a bespoke Medicine Africa platform set up for, for exactly this sort of uh, teaching. Uh, I think one of the questions that we've had from Adnan was, uh, are the, presumably, he said courses, but I think he probably means these teaching sessions, are they available um, to students at Burrow Medical School? Yeah, I, I think at the, at the moment I don't, that, they're, that they're not um, because they are real-time um, tutorials that go on. So people sign up and, and there's a real-time interaction. Uh, so they haven't been available because um, uh, the numbers are such that uh, you can't do this to too many people at a time and because they're integral to the courses at Armud and Hargeza. But I think there is scope for exploring uh, whether that you, know, you can expand this sort of program. There's, if you've got the volunteers who are able to do it, there's no reason why you can't do it more widely. And talking about expanding, um, has there been interest from Kings or has there been external interest from other medical schools uh, outside of Somaliland, for example? Um, well, our, our, we as Kings, we have um, three other main partnerships in Sierra Leone, in Zambia and DRC. Um, Sierra Leone is the only one of those with a real undergraduate link. And uh, we were, I guess, less successful in getting this to work in Sierra Leone, maybe because their medical school is a longer history, more established, uh, more faculty. Uh, so it was a little bit more difficult to get people engaged there. Uh, it has been used elsewhere. So the same program uh, has been used in uh, Palestinian medical schools. So the person who was uh, involved in setting up Medicine Africa uh, uh, was, in o was in Oxford, actually, like you, Zach. And, uh, uh, the, the Oxford um, Medical School had a link into a Palestinian medical school and did very similar work there through, uh, through Medicine Africa. Very interesting. Very interesting. I think my last question is, um, you know, I think it sounds like, you know, the, the partnership has really matured over a decade now, but uh, was there any resistance at the beginning uh, from you know from from the local medical schools or from the government about uh, from the about the partnership no i don't think there was resistance really um i think when these things start up uh, there's always um uh, anxiety because a lot of people come in and promise things uh, and say we can do this and let's have a partnership so i think in the early days there was just anxiety about you know, is this 
are these people going to deliver? Are they really still going to be here in five years time? Or is this just the enthusiasm of one person coming in and then when they go on to something else, it'll all fizzle out. Um, so I, I think until it's been going for uh, one, two, three years, people don't have confidence that it's going to keep going. But um, uh, once it once it had done that, once there's consistency, you know, Andy Leather has been involved in this right from the start uh, and is still involved. Uh, so I think once it showed that it you know, meant to continue happening, then there wasn't resistance. There are always issues about interacting with uh, ministries and government because ministers change quite frequently uh, and keeping that uh, engagement is difficult. The set for us have been a, a help for that because they've got a presence in country, because they've got Somali uh, people involved in them, they can make their contacts and uh, help that to happen. I think it's very difficult to, it would have been very difficult to get that engagement for us um, at a distance. Um, but because we don't have a presence there. Uh, it's, it's very different from our Sierra Leone partnership, for instance, where we have, you know, at one time after Ebola, we had, I don't know, 30, 40 people in, in country. Uh, we've never had that in Somaliland uh, because the context and the culture is just rather different. Uh, but, you know, that could be a way, particularly for people of um, Somali descent of uh, getting involved. I think that might be a real way forward for that. Thank you. Can I ask what you think the partnership will look like in a sort of post-COVID uh, yeah. era? <laughs> yeah, interesting, Shadi, isn't it? So um, I think there are things we've uh, found that can happen very easily distance-wise on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are, I think it's been, it has been much more difficult for us to run bits of the uh, master's program on Zoom. So uh, you can do most of it, but getting out there and having some face-to-face -face contact with people who are trying to get involved in planning and writing their dissertations uh, and just sort of sitting with them and doing that uh, is a little bit difficult, different. Um, I think it's been able to work because because we'd done it face to face before. So because we had relations with people and, and knew people, um, then it's a bit easier to make Zoom work. I think it's quite difficult to make Zoom work in some of these things or, or, uh, when you haven't developed that contact from earlier on. Uh, so I think we will probably do more online, but we will want to get back to some element of face-to-face. Um, -face. Uh, I think what it's shown us with the final exams is that we don't need to send so many external examiners to do the same thing. I think it's shown us that they can do this in, in most, in, you know, in some of the main universities. I think our gaze have shown that, our mood have shown that, Burao have shown that. Um, uh, and we could send somebody who would be more like a, a regular external examiner who would just be there and quality control the system, not be involved in actually running it. Uh, and that could be done by somebody from the UK or could be done by somebody more locally coming from Ethiopia or Kenya or something. So, you know, they could go. We've called ourselves external examiners, but we've really been Know, part of the doing the exam, whereas now I think you could change, they've shown that we could change to being proper external examiners. So I think, yeah, relations will change. Uh, and we do have plans to get involved in different ways to get to try to get a bit more involved in the group hospital and the way uh, care is organized and delivered and help people in the organization of that. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. I think perhaps the last question. Uh, is from Fitah who asks about whether there's any education technology, for example, virtual reality, uh, that you think might play a role yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in education uh, in Somaliland. Yeah, yeah, very good question. So I, I think uh, you know, they have very little in the way of uh, uh, simulation materials. So uh, I think just uh, 
uh, I think probably stepping back a bit from that, just simpler uh, models to able to uh, practice um, you know, safe delivery and obstetric care uh, and, and neonatal care. Uh, so setting up a proper skills center, skills lab to do that with a fairly basic simulation would be really helpful. And then when you've got that, then you could move on to other sorts of simulation. Uh, and I think that would be a way of taking forward into professional uh, learning and into professional practice too, which uh, is, I think, a little bit more difficult than here. I think there's a, quite a hierarchical system still uh, and uh, maybe simulation is a way to try to get into that and try to break that down and make people work together a little better yeah yeah i think really there would be a real need for uh, well i think if you had uh, funding to do that to do good simulation that would be helpful one, one of the problems with trying to do that in this sort of environment as i think we found in sierra leone is that just providing the equipment is not the answer because the equipment needs maintenance and needs looking after and you need to have the facilities to do that and, and the people to do that as well as just uh, providing equipment. Yeah. Uh, it's bang on time, seven o'clock. I think um, um, I just want to thank you, Professor Reese, on behalf of the British Somali Medical Association and the audience here today uh, for your um, uh, for your lecture, which was excellent, and uh, I hope that we uh, have you know we have more engagement with you in the future. Thank you. It was great pleasure to meet you all, and it would be great if we could uh, keep in touch uh, going forward. Absolutely. Thank you very. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Bye.